It is widely recognized today that innovation and entrepreneurship are important driving forces of the economy, perhaps the most important driving forces. So you might expect that economic theory would by now have incorporated these really important driving forces of the economy into basic textbooks, into our economics courses. Um, well, if you expected that, you might be a little surprised to find out that if you picked up the typical introductory microeconomics textbook, you would find either no or hardly any references to innovation and entrepreneurship. There have been some economists who have studied innovation and entrepreneurship and who have understood its central role in the economy and have made attempts to incorporate these concepts into economic theory. One of the most important ones was Josef Schumpeter. Schumpeter describes his ideas uh, partly in this book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, uh, in which he outlines his views about capitalism and socialism as economic systems and the relationship of these systems to the political system and democracy in particular. So the questions we will be asking today are, what is Schumpeter's critique of the neoclassical model, the mainstream economic theory uh, that was mainstream then and is still mainstream today, what are the central concepts of Schumpeter's view of capitalism? He doesn't think that the neoclassical view is the right one. It kind of misses the point. So what is the alternative he proposes? And then how do these ideas affect our thinking about innovation and entrepreneurship today? Before we talk about Schumpeter's theories of capitalism and his critique of mainstream economics, let's talk a little bit about that mainstream theory which, as I said, was mainstream back then and is mainstream today. What is the basic economic theory that you would study in a, an introductory economics course? Well, it revolves around markets and competitive markets uh, in particular. Uh, and the picture you will see uh, very often in a course like that is exactly this one, which has a supply curve and a demand curve. And each point on the supply and demand curves corresponds to a seller or a buyer in the marketplace. So every point on this supply curve is a seller in the marketplace. What is this supply curve telling us? Well, the central concept in this theory is price, which is what we put on the vertical axis. So this curve, the supply curve, shows us for any price, the quantity, which is what we put on the horizontal axis, the quantity that would be supplied in the marketplace at that particular price. The higher the price, the more that would be supplied. And every point, as I said, is, is on this curve a supplier. Here is a low cost supplier who is willing to supply some quantity even at a fairly low price. This supplier over here would be willing to supply only when price is much higher. So every point here is a, is a supplier saying, I'd be willing to supply if the price is right, if the price is high enough for me to uh, make it profitable uh, to supply the product that I'm selling. The demand curve shows for every price the quantity that would be demanded uh, of the good. At low prices, there would be a lot of quantity demanded. and At high prices, only a little bit of quantity demanded. So every point here is a customer, a potential customer, saying, I'll buy if the price is right. I'll buy, if I'm this customer, if the price is really low because my willingness and ability to pay is very low. If I'm this customer up here, I'll buy even if the price is really quite high. The central concept, of course, is equilibrium, which is where the, cro the lines cross, where these two curves meet. That price that corresponds to that equilibrium point is that magical price at which supply equals demand. The quantity supplied at this point equals the quantity demanded. So that's the central concept of our theory of markets. Price is the central notion and equilibrium is, is our idea of what is likely to happen in a marketplace like this. At that equilibrium price, not every supplier is selling actually. Only those for whom it makes it if for whom it makes sense to sell, for whom the price is high enough to cover their costs and make it profitable for them to sell. Who are those suppliers? Well, they are right here on this part of the supply curve. Uh, these suppliers are all saying, the price is right, I'm willing to sell, I'm in the market. 
the suppliers who are on the higher portions of the supply curve, they are not able to, to participate in the marketplace. They might if they could reduce their costs somehow, or if maybe demand increased and price increased, and it would be worthwhile for them to participate too. But as things stand at this equilibrium price in this market, these high cost suppliers, they are priced out of the market. Who are the buyers who are buying this quantity that's supplied at the equilibrium price by these lower cost suppliers? Well, they are those buyers who have high enough values to make it worthwhile for them to buy. They are these buyers on the upper part of the demand curve. These buyers who have lower willingness to pay than that equilibrium price, they are priced out of the market too. It's, it doesn't make sense for them to buy this product. It might some other time maybe if, if supply increased somehow or price somehow went down, it might make sense for these buyers on this lower part of the demand curve to participate in the market too. So they, the high value buyers are buying, the low cost sellers are selling, and that's one of the things we love about the competitive market. At the equilibrium price, it is the low cost suppliers who are supplying. Just as we wish it were, the high value buyers are buying. And therefore markets allocate resources efficiently. We use resources available to us through competitive markets that are allowed to operate freely, we use resources in such a way as to get the most bang for the buck or uh, the most consumer satisfac satisfaction given what resources are available to us. So this is all fine, and Schumpeter wouldn't say that price theory is necessary, necessarily wrong or that this is not right or that markets are not good, but at the same time, this theory does miss some very important features of the capitalist economy that we see. And according to Schumpeter, it misses some central features. So what is Schumpeter's critique of uh, competitive market theory? First of all, Schumpeter says, neoclassical theory is static. The market is dynamic, but neoclassical theory looks at one point in time, which means it's a static theory. And that could be very important, because when we say markets are efficient, we mean they are efficient at one point in time, in a static sense. Schumpeter says that is different from dynamic efficiency, which is being efficient over time. So he says, is it possible that, for instance, um, an economic system is efficient at any point in time, and yet, over time, there could be a way to make it more efficient. Is it possible that in order for us to um, reach efficiency in the long run, we must sacrifice some efficiency in the short run? We must be able to tolerate some inefficiency in the short run for us to reap the benefits in the long run. So that's the central question and an important distinction that Schumpeter made. And again, he says, neoclassical theory which, is theory, which is the mainstream theory I've been talking about, is perhaps making a mistake by looking at the market in a static way and not a dynamic way, not over time. Also, he says, many markets are not competitive. Our theories, uh, our, our supply and demand analysis are most valid for competitive markets. And Schumpeter says there are many markets out there that are not competitive, and actually economists know that. So to be fair, we do have theories that are not about competitive markets, but other market structures. We have some very well-developed theories. Nevertheless, Schumpeter says our intuition as economists and many of our policy arguments are based on thinking about competitive markets. And if many markets are not competitive, maybe that is, in a way, misleading. That might be a little misleading. Moreover, and here is a very important point for Schumpeter, our theory is ahistorical. Uh, it, does, it does not involve history in any meaningful way. We might use a historical example as we explain what we mean by competitive market, but history is not built into our theory. It's sort of hanging in a historical vacuum out there in, in a historical space. So for Schumpeter, that is a major shortcoming of uh, the theory. 
and maybe the most ironic uh, criticism of uh, competitive market theory is that it actually, if you look at the mathematics, could well be the description of a planned economy. If you look at the equations that describe competitive market equilibrium, those very equations could just as well describe a planned economy. And in fact, in the Soviet Union, when a planned economy was implemented with very limited success, the goal was to use exactly those kinds of equations. So those economic theorists who try to show that it is possible to plan an economy, they said, look, we could just take the same equations that competitive markets would be, uh, that would describe competitive markets. And we can use those equations to create equilibrium in a planned economy. So these are the main criticisms that Schumpeter brought up. And then, of course, he says, but I have a different view of capitalism. So let's talk about Joseph, capitalism is innovation Schumpeter's ideas about how we should think about capitalism, the capitalist economic system. But first, a few words about the man himself. He was born in the 19th century in Austria-Hungary and his life took him then to Vienna where he was educated. He uh, took on aristocratic airs, tried to learn to behave like an aristocrat and apparently those manners stayed with him his whole life, even in his years in the United States teaching at Harvard University. Um, he said he aspired to be the world's greatest economist, the best horseman in Austria and the greatest lover in all of Vienna. He supposedly added that he had been successful in reaching two of those goals because uh, things weren't going so well with the horses. A uh, recent and very interesting biography of Schumpeter is that written by Thomas McCraw, Prophet of Innovation. He had a variety of experiences. He was an academic. But he was also Minister of Finance for some time. He was bank president. He suffered from death stint throughout his life with large debts. He moved to Harvard in 1932 and uh, was one of the earliest academic superstars who, who, were, who were lured to Harvard with a very high salary. He had a, a great influence on intellectual life at Harvard University. He was a center of the intellectual life in the economics department. He had uh, students, he had a following, he had a very famous student, Paul Samuelson, uh, who later received the Nobel Prize in economics and is uh, one of the giants, maybe the giant of economic science in the 20th century. So that's Schumpeter, the man. Let's talk about his ideas. How did Schumpeter think about capitalism? How did he describe capitalism? First of all, he was a great fan of capitalism. He thought capitalism was not just an economic system that led to great progress, to great wealth, to prosperity. He actually credited capitalism with much more than that. He went so far as to say that all the feature and achievement of modern civilization are directly or indirectly the products of the capitalist process. Even the rugged individualism of a scientist uh, was a product, according to Schumpeter, of uh, the capitalist process, uh, was a manifestation of capitalism. And that rationalist attitude, which according to him forced itself on the human mind primarily from economic necessity, that rationalist um, attitude led us to the kind of rational thought that is central to modern civilization and even to logic. So Schumpeter goes so far as to say all logic is derived from the pattern of economic decision, or to use a pet phrase of mine, that the economic pattern is the matrix of logic. Matrix in the sense of mother of uh, logic. So he loved capitalism. He credited it with pretty much everything that's worth having in the modern world. And the central feature of capitalism, according to Schumpeter, is constant change, or using a different word, innovation. So economic life, according to him, is about innovation. The fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumer's goods, the new methods of production or transportation, innovation, right? The new markets, the new forms of industrial organization that the capitalist enterprise creates. So innovation 
is the central feature of the capitalist system. It is not, as the neoclassical theory would have us believe, crisis that we should be studying, but it is innovation. In capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, I'm quoting Schumpeter again, it's not that kind of competition, price competition, that counts. But the competition from the new commodity, the new technology, and these are the, the ways in which people will innovate in the capitalist system, according to Schumpeter. The new source of supply, the new organization, which strike not at the margins of the profits and the outputs of the existing firms, but at their foundations and their very lives. Schumpeter says competition is not about raising or lowering your price a little bit, or perhaps saving a bit here or saving a bit there. Competition is much, much more harsh than that. And the stakes are high indeed, according to Schumpeter. Capitalism and that process of innovation is about what he calls creative destruction, because this constant innovation actually leads to a destruction of the old ways. So when something new and really revolutionary comes along, as it often does, according to Schumpeter, that destroys the old ways of doing things. That's what he calls creative destruction, which is really the central notion in his analysis, his understanding of capitalism. So isn't that kind of creative destruction wasteful? It is destruction, after all. Couldn't it be that it might be better to hang on to those old ways for a little longer to make use of those old ways? Well, here we return to Schumpeter's uh, notions of static versus dynamic efficiency, which become really important. Because it might seem like, in a static sense, it would be, in fact, less wasteful to hang on to those old ways for longer. But, Schumpeter says, it often is the case that if you look at the process over time, in a, in a dynamic setting, you will find that creative destruction creates much more than it destroys, actually. So we really come out ahead with creative destruction. But it might seem wasteful. In the moment, in the short run, it might seem wasteful. Notice how that idea of time, the economic process taking place over time, is so important for Schumpeter. And that is, in fact, his view of capitalism. It's an evolutionary view. So that means studying markets in a static way, like neoclassical theory, according to Schumpeter, does, might be especially inappropriate and perhaps even misleading. The next question, then, is what is the, the nature of this kind of competition in build, involving creative destruction? What is the true nature of competition? If it isn't just that little price competition that strikes at the margins of uh, profits, but really creative destruction that endangers the very existence of established old firms and maybe even entire industries. What is the nature of competition? And here, we must distinguish between Schumpeter's early theories and Schumpeter's later theories. In early theories, Schumpeter Mark I, as it is called by uh, students of Schumpeter's uh, thought, in those early theories, the heroes are the entrepreneurs. They are the ones who make, make it happen. They are the forces behind that creative destruction. Who are these entrepreneurs? What kind of people are they? And according to Schumpeter, they are not simply driven by making money, but by ambition for other things. First of all, there is the dream and the will to found a private kingdom, usually, though not necessarily, also a dynasty. Then there is the will to conquer, the impulse to fight, to prove oneself superior to others, to succeed for the sake not of the fruits of success, but of success itself. And finally, there is the joy of creating, of getting things done, or simply exercising one's energy and ingenuity. So for Schumpeter, Mark I, these entrepreneurs are heroic figures. And they are the individuals who drive that gale of creative destruction which makes capitalism progress, which drives the engine of capitalism. 
If you think about the heroes that we read about today, of uh, heroes of economic life, of progress, um, you might recognize that kind of character. You might see that kind of character in Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or other entrepreneurs of the day. When Schumpeter looked around later in his life in the 1930s and 1940s, he did not see them. What he saw was large companies, large corporations that were actually really quite good at innovation. A lot of new innovative products came out of these large corporations. But they were not driven by those heroic individuals he envisioned in his early career in 1911 or the 1920s. So um, he, he, in fact, believed this wouldn't be too surprising. If you think about the fact that creative destruction will probably crush anything innovative you create within a short time, then why would you even bother creating something very new and innovative? Unless, of course, you were a very, very large corporation that is not going to be easily crushed. Um, so he thought it made some sense that these large corporations, these very large companies, would be where innovation would be coming from. And in fact, he believed that this trend of capitalism moving towards more and more big business was going to continue. Big business, however, doesn't need the kinds of heroic figures uh, whom he envisioned as heroes of the capitalist system earlier. Big business needs administrators, good managers, not wild entrepreneurs. So as big business becomes more and more important, that entrepreneurial culture that drives capitalism, that actually dies, according to Schumpeter. That's his, that's his prediction. He sees that culture dying, and if that culture dies, he thinks maybe capitalism itself will slowly die. So he leaves us with that somewhat pessimistic, maybe very pessimistic, view of the future of capitalism. If Schumpeter saw the 1980s, the 1990s, maybe what we see today, perhaps he would change his mind and perhaps he would recognize again those heroic entrepreneurial figures he saw early in his career. So let's go back to those three questions we asked at the beginning about Schumpeter. What's his critique of neoclassical theory? To summarize, Schumpeter says, capitalism is not about markets being in equilibrium. What is it about then? According to Schumpeter's theories, it is about innovation, entrepreneurship, and this central notion of creative destruction. So what are the implications of these views? If you believe Schumpeter, if you subscribe to these ideas, what are the implications of that? Well, there are impl implications in theory, in research, in policy making, and even in the business world. In fact, one might say uh, Schumpeter's influence was uh, perhaps a little, a little bigger uh, in, in the business world and, and maybe in policy than uh, in economic theory. Though he was very much a recognized and respected uh, Harvard economist uh, in his day, he did not have the kind of influence on economic theory that he wished he would have had, or according to him, that he should have had. So, in research, questions that you might want to ask if you believe that creative destruction is the central driving force of the capitalist economy would be, where does innovation take place? Is it in large firms, in these uh, big corporations that Schumpeter saw late in his life? Or is it really in very small startups? Um, where, where do most innovations come from? Um, and and is that, does that vary with industry? And what's the role in that process of the entrepreneur? And who are, who are the entrepreneurs and what are they like? So these are research questions that people have asked, um, inspired by the seminal work of Schumpeter and some others. In policy, Schumpeter's work might lead you to ask, what is the role of regulation? And Schumpeter himself understood that there was a role for regulation. He, he did not think that creative destruction left on its own would be all good. 
uh, after all, there would be quite a bit of destruction. Perhaps the government has a role to, to play in helping those who are being destroyed by new innovative ways, and helping those cushioning the fall a bit, helping them maybe transfer resources to some more productive uses. So even Schumpeter thought there was a role for policy, for regulation. Um, what's, what is the role of regulation when it comes to monopolies? Are monopolies all bad if a lot of innovation comes out of monopolies, as Schumpeter saw in his lifetime? Uh, how can you encourage innovation in large firms generally, and maybe even in monopolies? How can you encourage innovation and at the same time prevent uh, the kinds of inefficiencies that monopolies usually lead to? And in business, if you believe that creative destruction is what drives markets and what drives capitalist progress, then in the business world, uh, you might want to, first of all, understand the process really well, and second, perhaps understand how you can be on the right side of that creative destruction. One uh, literature that grew out of uh, Schumpeter's work and notion of creative destruction that, is, that has become very important in the business world and in uh, business schools is Clayton Christensen's notion of disruptive innovation, which he described in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. His notion of disruptive innovation is very similar to Schumpeter's ideas about creative destruction. So, Schumpeter criticized the neoclassical model for missing the mark, studying the wrong thing in a way by focusing on markets in a static sense and prices. Instead, Schumpeter says capitalism is about innovation. It's a great system. It has brought lots of progress and lots of great things to civilization. And the central driving force of capitalism is the notion of creative destruction. The heroes of that process are entrepreneurs, or perhaps big corporations, or perhaps both, some balance of both of those.